how often do you Ooh, sorry hello jenny welcome to the show hello thank you for having me i am very excited about the conversation because we met in a different context and i learned that you're a pricing expert and there's this huge taboo around facilitators to talk about money and pricing and it's something that almost everyone struggles with so here i am with the expert in the <laughs> field and still i still ask the same question every time to open so we'll start with that do you call yourself a facilitator <laughs> Great. Uh, so firstly, facilitators are not alone in finding pricing hard. So I will try to share as many practical tips as we go today to sort of ease, ease that uh, yeah. pricing journey for everybody. Um, I do call myself a facilitator um, and I have learned by bringing uh, brilliant facilitators into my business um, and so I've learned really by observing them and kind of picking up their tactics um, uh, and working in partnership with them. So now I do also facilitate. Mm. Um, my business is focused on pricing. So we live and breathe how to price. Um, it's a consultancy. So we help organizations with all aspects of their pricing, whether that's setting fees for new products and services, uh, changing fees for existing products and services, communicating price changes. Um, and we also think about how prices are framed in the, the purchase journey for your customer. So we believe that how, how customers are shared and when um, is often as important as the numbers themselves mm. um, and so facilitation is actually critical and cherished part of our toolkit because pricing is such a divisive subject so you'll find that um, uh, uh, in scale-ups or larger organizations there are so many opinions about pricing and you'll be dealing with lots of senior execs who all have a different vantage point they've all got different needles that they need to move uh, and pricing can play a very different role for them uh, and so the magic of facilitation comes into play there by helping and guiding an executive team through their pricing decisions um, and uh, um, like extracting all of the mm -hmm. relevant inputs and views and existing knowledge, helping a team to really surface what they already know, what they yeah. think they know and what they'd like to know. And then we bring that together with building new evidence that's going to directly inform their pricing decisions and remove some of that guesswork mm. um, through various kinds of research. Beautiful. Thank you for also sharing how facilitation kind of fuels into your work. And I can definitely see the value because it's also about disentangling what about the pricing conceptions are emotional and what are actually factual. And I can imagine that for a product, it's quite easy-ish because you have very clear costs and expenses that you have to take into consideration for consulting services, facilitation services, coaching services, it's much more an emotional business, as it seems, where pricing mm -hmm. is difficult to anchor. So maybe we can start with, a, with one question. I'm really curious. What is the biggest misconception that is around <laughs> yeah. Yeah. pricing? Biggest mis misconception, I think, is that pricing's hard uh, or that it's out of reach for um, organizations of any size or freelancers. Um, 
I think it's uh, a process. So, so you're right that in facilitation or coaching or creative industries, the outcome for the customer can feel less tangible, right? So it, mm. it's perhaps not directly measurable. Um, and uh, so the value you're delivering is therefore in the eye of the beholder. And so it can feel very hard to price accordingly right and to to know where 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 am I what are the uh uh like the what is the cross my prospective client thinking in terms of Mm. a suitable price and and what I'm worth um you're you're smiling yes because you you said a few words and I'm like yes I want to dive deeper can I please (laughs) zoom into that can I double click on that one is worth Yes. How do, how do I know what I'm worth? And there, yeah. I hear many of the coaches saying, oh, charge what you're worth. Is this just buzz or is there <laughs> something to that? It sounds very empowering, doesn't it? But uh, I think for many, it's fairly useless because it doesn't give any clues about how to how to do that. So So let's talk about um how to value your the value that you're providing um so that you can then consider that in how you price um so the the answer fortunately isn't rocket science and it really includes getting closer to your customers or your prospects and really understanding what they're looking to do and what they're looking to achieve so willingness to pay isn't an inherent property of a product or a service that you're delivering it's very concept, uh, uh, very uh, subjective and very contextual. Mm. So if I said, what's, um, what's a pint of beer worth? Then the only correct answer really is to whom? Because mm-hmm. to wine lovers, the answer might be nothing. But then it, uh, to beer drinkers, it still depends on the context, mm-hmm. right? So you might be willing to pay a lot more for uh, a cold beer on a hot day from the only beer standard to festival, whereas you'd be willing to pay an awful lot less for the same beer from a rundown grocery store. So, yeah. so warm in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly. So what something is worth uh, is going to be very different to your different perspective clients. Um, and you need to get closer to uh, what they're looking to achieve. Mm-hmm. So think through the t- like the tangible benefits. So are there th- measurable things that they're looking to drive, whether that's more unlocking more sales or uh, saving time, for example, but then the intangible benefits too. So are there social or emotional benefits? Are you just relieving a blockage that's been there and frustrating mm-hmm. everyone for a while? Are you going to make them look good? Um, is there a, a a brand benefit somehow? And then the third thing is they're getting closer to their alternatives. Mm. So if they don't work with you, what are their alternatives? So that might be turning to another facilitator or another coach. Uh, so your competitors, if you like. But which ones are they? Because uh, which ones that your prospective customer might turn to might be very different to the ones you think uh, of as competitors. But also there's the do nothing or do it themselves or some kind of clunky workaround. And I think only then when you have an understanding of, uh, of tangible benefits, intangible benefits and their alternatives, can you really start to grasp what this means to to the customer? Yeah. Um, and and the best way to do that really is to you need to talk to your customers or prospects. Um, and there's a wonderful book called 
I'm just reaching for it now, called The Mum Test. By oh, Robert yes, I Lynch. love that one. Yeah, which I think is really great. It's, it's very short, very easy to read. It's all about the art of asking questions in a way that your mum can't lie to you. Um, and I find these are brilliant for unlocking, uh, for getting comfortable with asking questions to do with value and to do with price. Um, so te- take yeah. a look at that book. Very good one. Um, and it's so, everyone can relate to that because if we're telling our mom about our next business idea, she'll say, yes, of course, it's brilliant. You're going to be rich. Exactly. Exactly. Who would not pay for that? Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, how to ask her different questions. Very good um, book tip. And what I hear is, so there's a lot about the pre-work and then also how to communicate it. Because then you you come to the the price and would you then communicate... all the layers yes so let, let's let's talk a bit more about coming to the price because yeah. we've talked a bit about that um customer perspective if you like mm-hmm. so so you're getting an understanding of what it means to them and i think that'll mean it'll mean different things to different people mm-hmm. often um so try to incorporate questions in your sales conversations that really get to the heart of what they're trying to do and unlock um and you'll you'll pick up when uh it's a very kind of strategic meaningful outcome mm-hmm. or or when it's not um and that'll give you those early clues about when um you, you know you've got some headroom for, potentially with your with your price um, but then also think about from your perspective. So from the facilitator's perspective, I think there there's lots to consider as well. So where are you at in your business and kind of what do do some simple maths. So let's say uh, you're fairly new to facilitation uh, and you're looking, you, you know how much you want to earn. Mm-hmm. Right, so you've got a good uh, um, understanding of how much you want to earn to cover the bills, get that lovely holiday in, do whatever it is you want to do, and you've also got an idea of how much um, billable time that you want to fill as well. Mm-hmm. So there is an easy calculation there to perhaps get a an initial minimum or a a, a, a guide price, an anchor, an anchor exactly. But then. I think it also depends on your situation. So if you are just starting out and it's really important to you to collect those client logos, extend your experience, um, then maybe it's not time to be particularly aggressive with your price. Mm -hmm. Um, Alternatively, if you're so busy, you're uh, rushed off your feet, actually, it's probably time to start considerably raising your prices. Right. Uh, and if volume drops a little bit as a result, then you're probably still earning more, but doing less. Mm. So I think there's that bringing together of what you need pricing to do for you. And it's such a key lever in your business, right? Because whether you're an independent facilitator or a large corporate or anything in between, like your how you price is inextricably linked with your brand and your positioning and your product and services and and all those kind of decisions it's it's got to just pull in the same same direction um as all of those other other things yeah and it's so emotional because we do link our own worth to it (laughs) although it might be just a buzz sentence by coaches and i think it's also signal something to the client. So yes. what I heard you explaining is to really focus on what pain are we solving, releasing for the client? What is the value? What is maybe the costs of not having the workshop or not hiring us? Um, and the better we understand that, the more we understand how much we can actually charge. But then also it's about 
how what is the impact of us charging maybe too much or too little yes because i think we are sending a signal um that yeah when we're charging a lot the signal is oh we are very busy absolutely or, yes we are very well trained um Absolutely. So um, I, I think in you talked about that emotional tie to pricing. So you, you're right. And, and I encourage each facilitator to think about what that um, make you smile price is. Right. No one likes being squeezed on price mm -hmm. because then you enter into the relationship with a sort of a reluctancy and it, do, it doesn't feel good. Right. So what is your um, feel great price? And mm -hmm. when someone is feeling like they're paid what they're worth, I, I hope you know what that feels like, because it you know, that really brings the best out in you. So think about what that is. Also think about what your walk away point is mm. before any kind of uh, uh, pricing or negotiation conversation. What is that walk away point? Because if you are willing to move on price, then knowing that in advance, again, puts you on the front foot to have those kind of, of discussions. Um, and then you were talking about um, almost the relationship between your price and your uh, reputation. Mm -hmm. So are you worryingly cheap or are you reassuringly expensive or somewhere in the middle? And I think that's, um, yeah, again, something that needs to fit with how you're positioning your services and to whom. So are you a bu building a brand that you are a really... I don't know, elite facilitator for this very specific audience. Um, and so your price needs to fit with that persona that you're uh, that you're putting out there mm. um, or, or, or something else. You're excessively priced, uh, but and perhaps you um, uh, ease off on the scope a little bit to make that price accessible for more audiences. Mm. It, somehow I just thought of the image of a boutique and usually what we see is that the fewer items there are in the boutique the higher the price yeah. <laughs> yeah and is it the same for these kind of services that the more I found my niche the more I am specialized in one specific thing the higher mm -hmm. usually is my price mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, so. So one thing that definitely springs to mind in you saying that is to avoid a long shopping list of prices. So um, I've seen too often where uh, wonderful facilitators or businesses have this sort of itemized list of all the components of what they do. Uh, expecting their prospective customer to then know what they want from it mm. and um, mm. kind of pick and do lots of maths and figure it out themselves. Um, and I think that can be quite off-putting. But my strong recommendation is that you always offer your, your prospective customers options to choose from at different price points. And three is a really magic number there. Mm. So if you can uh, conceive of three different um, either bundles of different elements of your service. Uh, so you've got a, a you see this everywhere because it works so well. Right. Think about a small, medium, large in a coffee shop mm. or a bronze, silver, gold on a subscription tier. The same goes for professional services. Now, what is that? Oh, if you throw in all the bells and whistles, what is your gold offering? Uh, take some stuff out. What does silver look like? And then what does bronze look like? And it's such an effective technique because it's very empowering to your customer. Everybody likes having a choice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, it, and it shifts them from a, a mindset, a binary mindset of, oh, should I buy this or not? To, oh, which, which? should I buy? Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and um, getting them to really think about what they care about uh, and what they value. Um, and I think if you you have bundled together different aspects of a service, then that also puts you in the position of expert, right? Because you are recommending for a you prospective customer in your situation, I recommend these um, dif- these different packages are, are going to get you where you need to get to, to different degrees. Um, but it also uh, lets you um, anchor the prospect's uh, perception of your prices if you can price up that gold option considerably mm-hmm. right so what's the best way to sell a two thousand pound watch you put it right next to a ten thousand pound watch um and it's the that common cognitive bias of of anchoring yeah. where we lean too heavily on available comparisons when we comprehend or, or evaluate a number mm. and so next to the ten thousand pound watch the two thousand pound watch seems like a bargain whereas yes. if it was next yeah. to a 50 pound watch it would seem very premium yeah and so for if you're laying out your facilitation services and there are some options to choose from, then that gold option needs to be very expensive compared to the others. And some will go for it because they want everything you can offer. But even for those who pick bronze or silver, it's played an anchoring role in how those they perceive those lower prices. Um and just final final uh, uh, thought on it is that it then also puts you on the front foot for any negotiations that follow because you've already laid out how scope and uh, changes for price to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, if they then ask for something extra or to remove something, you know exactly in which range you are yeah. navigating. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's a good one for uh, anyone out there who isn't sure what their customers are willing to pay um, and doesn't really feel like uh, they have a good handle on uh, what it's worth to the customer. Then you're by laying out three options at different price points, you're therefore appealing to different budgets and different needs in one go. And you facilitate it for the client, <laughs> not expecting them there to do the math. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I wonder, so when I hear more options, um, I wonder to, if you have some experience with reducing options um, and increasing the price. So where I'm coming from is there are customers that are short in money and others are short in time. Mm-hmm. And usually those who are short in time, they have more money to spend and they would actually be happy to spend less time in the offerings we have. And it seems to me like very often we run into the trap to just add more and more and more. Oh, you get a full day workshop and you get two hours um, coaching sessions and you get 50 hours of my online training. Yeah. Whereas... Whereas it might be more valuable for them to have the 50 hours training actually curated in 90 minutes. Here's what you need to know. And okay, I do a 20 minutes power coaching over coffee. What is your experience with charging more for a more curated or shorter service? Great. So I think, so you talked about two different audiences there, some that um, prize time uh, and some that prize, uh, so uh, price, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Money. Yes. And so I think um, I would definitely encourage you to, your options need to be different for those different audiences and to make sure that each of the three options say are highly relevant um, but it's the framing that's then really crucial. So uh, 
almost the the little statement that might go with that gold option for the um uh for the team that are so squeezed for time need to reflect that actually we do the hard yards so that you, when we come together for these very short bursts the the like everything's done and these get you from a to b with as minimum input from you as possible um and so i think it's all about the the framing and just because you have less face time doesn't mean that there's less value to the customer as you're suggesting is probably more for that time strapped um uh, executive or, or whoever it is and thank you now it um now it makes sense so if i understand you correctly it would the same strategy as with a different price points would be then with a different time point so if if i mm. try to sell something very short for a very high price people might think oh what's that but if i put it next to something that is considerably cheaper but takes longer then they see the difference and hence they understand the value exactly Mm. exactly that yeah to provide anchors yeah and i've got another thought for you just on um designing relevant options mm -hmm. and obviously i'm assuming here that you're not publishing your prices online for example where they need to be same price and same service for everybody so so just uh, need to tackle it slightly differently if if uh, things are public but just if they're not so you're writing a, a proposal each time or it's just yeah uh, behind closed doors then if you're struggling to design three choices um yeah that it could be differentiating by the components so so what ingredients you put together to make the three different cakes um or you just made a great example there of uh like time so how quickly does this happen and get done um but it could be it could be other things too so it could be even uh the if the service is the same um it could be about length of commitment mm. or it could be about payment terms or uh, or something else so it doesn't mm. yeah some some find it hard to um kind of tease out three different options yeah. but actually think as creatively as you like about what dimension you're you're differentiating on. yeah or synchronous support coaching support guidance yeah, yeah. Yes. Follow up, follow up sessions. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. A service um, level too, in a way. So how um, how accessible are you during yeah. that period of engagement? Uh, and yeah. in what format? And is it face to face? Are there face to face elements or not? Is it all remote or not? Um, yeah. Although that does, um, I, I saw uh, a lot of. Uh, like facilitators and coaches and professional services during um, at the start of the pandemic, just dropping their fees because suddenly they were um, operating remotely rather than in person. And that just, yeah, that broke my heart because when you actually get to the bottom of, well, are the outcomes any less? or yes. um you know the value of what you're delivering hasn't changed so you've unnecessarily dropped your fees and I, I i don't think uh particularly at that time uh customers care about your travel costs not being in there or they, they don't care about the those things they care about the outcomes and the uh where you're getting them to yes what a wonderful example um it broke my heart too and it was actually interesting to observe also how it changed over the years throughout the pandemic. And I think at the beginning, why the fees dropped was also because the clients asked it, because they didn't see the value first in online facilitation. Yes. Um, that it was just, oh, then you can do it 
it, it doesn't cost you. And it was as if it wasn't the same. Yeah. Um, and only later they realized that it actually asked for even more preparation, that it's more complex, um, that we have to be more rigorous on the agenda. And um, I, I carried out a pricing survey um, of, um, I think it was mid 2020. And it was very interesting because there was still um, a difference, quite a big difference between online and offline. And usually um, offline would be considerably more expensive than online facilitation. And over the two and a half years, this gap has almost closed. Yes. Great to yeah. hear. Okay. Yeah. Which is a, yeah, which is a good thing, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Because as you say, it's the value that we are selling and not the format. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And at the time, um, the, you know, the toolkit needed to change and yeah. the techniques needed to kind of step forward into the online only domain. And uh, there's a lot of hard work that sits behind that um, yeah. to, to make it so effective online. And then again, I think um, over the pandemic, also the clients realized how big the pain actually is yes, and yes. that they do Boy. need professional facilitators. So yes. the willingness to pay increased. Yes. Yeah. Luckily. And I would be curious about, you just said that you assume that most of the facilitation services, the prices would be um, not displayed on the website. So what are your recommendations? How transpa why is that? What holds us back from displaying our prices? And is it actually a good thing or do you have some recommendations to mm. give guidance? Yeah. So again, I think it comes back to your customers to some degree. So if they are shopping around um, and others that they are also looking at to publish their pricing, then if you haven't published your pricing online, then it might be off-putting. So it's, mm. it's easier to go with someone where it's all there than picking up the phone to you. Um, but then also if you publish your um, prices online, I think it can uh, detach from having the conversation that is so important to closing a sale often. Um, so it can, yeah, uh, it also depends on how you like to nurture your leads mm -hmm. um, uh, and how much contact you want with them. But it would also remove your ability to price for different clients differently, uh, which could be really important. And, and I think that's that's um important to to acknowledge is that it's okay to price different clients differently mm -hmm. so whether uh, a, a common example might be you might be comfortable charging one rate for private sector another for public sector or charity work mm -hmm. Um, and so in your portfolio of clients, yes, there's some uh, kind of the, the private sector clients are, are helping bump up your um, your margins, but but that's OK. But it might um, it also depends on, yeah, what it means to one client A versus client B. So you can you can react to that accordingly. Yes, and what does it mean in terms of discounts then? In terms of discounts, okay. Uh, so I have two recommendations when it comes to discounts. So the first is, um, in fact, let's go for three. So firstly, <laughs> don't ever offer, offer a discount for no reason. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you... Um, in hiring uh, uh, professional services myself, kind of when it comes to that pricing conversation, so often it's been like, oh, my rate is blah, 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 blah. But it's the first time we've worked together, so I'm happy to take off 20%. And I was like, whoa, I just, you know, I didn't, you didn't give me a moment to react and you've just shaved off 20% to your price for absolutely no reason. So, so please don't do that. It was what's your reaction? So what what is going through your mind when you hear that? 
that this person isn't confident in their own pricing and that they're open to negotiation. So mm-hmm. if if they've told me off the bat there's 20% room for manoeuvre, I can probably get a lot more if I need to. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, personally, my response, because I'm a pricing consultant, is to say, don't do that. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Um Second tip is uh, if the um, if the uh, prospective client is asking for a discount, then please find a way to adjust the scope to accompany that drop in price. Mm. Um, so again, going back to the idea of sharing three different options at three different price points, that helps you facilitate that conversation about what needs to come out for this to still work for them, but just you're doing less. Um, so if uh, otherwise, if you're just offering a straight discount on um, uh, the original scope, then you're you're devaluing it. Mm-hmm. Um And then the third thing is uh, rather than if it's not possible to change the scope, what other quid pro quo could you ask for in exchange for that discount? So something else that works for you. So it might be that they pay in full up front to help Mm -hmm. with your cash flow or... uh, what, what else? They commit to a certain amount or a number of workshops. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. have a longer commitment yeah. period. Um, I generally find asking for kind of testimonials or recommendations mm. is not actually not a good thing to ask for because happy clients will do that for you anyway. So yes. that's, uh, yeah. True. And it also, Again, what do they think about me when before even starting the job, you get a discount in exchange for a testimonial? Yeah, yeah exactly. You're buying yeah. the testimony. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. Or it could be, uh, say, it's you're starting to work with quite a large organization. Is it that they have, uh, that they're happy to uh, conduct or set up five intro conversations with five other departments for mm. you or again so what good. what is it think about what it is that could work for you yeah. uh, because there are yeah. many, many currencies beyond price that actually could be yeah beneficial or oh another one uh could be that you schedule the work in your quiet period for example mm. good one so to work on the timing then of the delivery yeah. and the, the internal referral um, made me think of something else. Sometimes when, um, when we work with large corporates and we set for price, then this is the price. And then it's very difficult to increase the price over time yes. or working with, um, yeah, is different team in the same organization you cannot suddenly charge more yeah there's a precedent then exactly so i always thought that it might make sense to charge a little bit more so to have a higher price but then to find ways to give them a discount in order to to keep this the opportunity <laughs> alive or how do you see other other ways to to deal with that um, so with a with a corporate organization with the future pricing you mean mm-hmm. yes with having future flexibility yeah so I think um uh it helps when in future you're not comparing apples to apples so perhaps that mm-hmm. uh when you're working with the second department or another piece of work with the first department that somehow it's not directly comparable to what you did last time. Um, But then also, I think that that corporate memory is often shorter than you think it is as well. Mm. Maybe you, the decision makers are different people in the organization the second time around. So don't just, even if 
even if it is the same people, don't assume that they have that memory. And I think if you're looking to raise your prices next time round, you can do so with with confidence if you're able to, um, I guess, narrate any challenges that uh, or, or handle any challenges that come back to you. Um, so again, like if you get pushed back on price in that situation, well, you were price X last time, this looks kind of similar, it's price Y now, why is that? Um, revert back to uh, what you've learned about what it means to them and uh, which needles they need to move, who is in, you know, uh, and that's often, um, diff there might be different decision makers or influences in the decision in that organization that care about different things but also feel confident uh, that you have you're always developing as a facilitator and yeah. you're getting better and better at what you do you already have that sort of tacit understanding of the of the organization so the learning curve will be less steep um and that yeah the value of what you do is increasing you're in increasing levels of demand and so you have priced up accordingly yeah yeah and what i hear is that it's um what are the pros and cons that you see in having standard prices like a menu card even if it's easy to understand menu card <laughs> yes <laughs> well i think it's easier for you mm. um uh and uh but but if your clients aren't talking to each other and if mm. you're not publishing your pricing it does mean that you're probably going to leave money on the table in mm. certain situations um yeah but it's it, i think um uh often there's a lot of hesitancy to experiment with price right if you've kind of done the pricing and it's set and then I think people like to just then focus on, on other things because it's easier but actually that kind of context is always changing and uh it's it doesn't have to be complicated to experiment with price so just think about your next five proposals and how you might experiment within that um almost do you nudge the price up by 10% each time or or 50% if you're really busy mm. um and if you if you are offering a bronze silver gold then which are people going for because mm. if they're always going for your gold then it's probably time to either create a new gold and add some more bells and whistles in or to increase your prices ah uh, yeah Good one. And I it almost sounds as if um, if I would have packaged services that are almost like products. Yeah. Then yeah. it might make sense to have a menu. This is what you get. Yeah. Shipping is easy. But then if it's more tailored, if it's more nuanced, um, then there's also more conversation with the client. And then we have more room for adjustments yes and so it's yeah. even more relevant to their particular case yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one more question also um regarding the credibility or the playing with prices so playing with prices is beautiful when it's behind the curtains yeah if you are selling something and you put the price on the website Yes. How harmful is, or what are the risks of, what is worse, underpricing or overpricing and how to <laughs> deal with price changes? <laughs> yes, yeah, great question. Um, so I think underpricing and overpricing can have long-term ramifications that you need to think through, right? So if you're, uh, if you actually don't have, repeat clients and your business is really a kind of one-off project model then I guess that the the risks of either are limited to that particular case um but as I think you're suggesting with the second part of your question there 
Um, if you're hoping for repeat business, then at some point you're going to have to kind of cha change the price going going forward. So if you underprice, then there's obviously the uh, risk of leaving money on the table, um, but also giving across the perception that you are or you might make your prospect question the quality of your service mm. if you really underpriced so if they're seeing this difference between oh wow I was expecting like a seriously high quality facilitator here but this price is so low it's making me question that quality mm. um uh, and yeah, it's a, it's then an anchor point that is harder to move up from. And then if you overprice, obviously there's uh, a risk that you lose the you lose the job, um, uh, and you've priced yourself out. So again, I go back to your personal situation. So are you rushed off your feet? So can be a bit more aggressive with price or a bit more um, ballsy with price. Or actually, do you just need to secure the next few clients and it's time to sort of be a bit less aggressive? Um, uh, also, um, I don't want to jump around here, but another um, suggestion for if you have a suspicion that your prospective client doesn't quite get the value of what you do and you're mm. like, hmm. And you probably, you know, your gut's telling you, oh, I don't think they're going to like my prices because I'm not sure they've got it yet. Or, you know, they are not experienced with facilitation, so they haven't seen it in action. Then I definitely encourage you to think about how you could give them a flavor of the magic. Mm. Um, so at Untapped, we offer uh, many prospects a, a 90 minute, we call it a pricing springboard session, uh, where which we design and facilitate, get all of their kind of key stakeholders in the pricing decision in the room and start helping them align on their vision for pricing and surface lots of the roadblocks that might get in the way and also react to a prototype of a, a proposal. So some, a, a prototype of some, a process that we might take them through. Um, and normally that is, for, for our clients, is actually the first time they've experienced facilitation. And the words they use at the end to describe it normally include things like illuminating and uh transformational and you know it's wonderful and so it's like okay we've we've they've got they get it now mm -hmm. um now obviously you might not want to invest like 90 minutes and the prep uh into uh something like that but, but what could it be that both helps them see the value get them making progress a little bit on us on their on their subject also the uh we find it is golden because we then basically get get all the inputs we need to write a really great proposal exactly and i think they are already they see where this could be going so they um they want to continue and i think there's also the something about the reciprocity so they received something they they received something of value. So yes. then they also feel kind of obliged to commit and to give back. Absolutely. And last uh, thought why this is working, I guess, they've already committed to put um, time in it because the commitment of putting all key stakeholders who are um, discussing the pricing means that these are the highest paid people in the company if they are investing 90 minutes in the session this already means something so and there's something cognitively that feels bad if oh now we have invested this already do we really want to stop yeah exactly that and, yeah. and often um I get asked do you like have you thought about charging for those sessions because they are creating value but we don't and we definitely don't intend to because of everything you've just said mm. like it really um yeah it is quite a powerful tool yeah. um uh, that i think anyone can figure out a way to to do 
Absolutely. And I just assume that, yes, you do charge for the session, but only afterwards. So basically, once they sign then the deal, it will be a higher price. It's a premium service because they know what they're buying. Yes. yes. And that's why it's, uh, yeah. They're bought in and there's that trust there and familiarity yeah. from the outset. Yeah. yeah. And if you would charge for it, it would give it a different flavor. The prospect clients would come in with a different expectation. Yes. Um, and they would be looking for, oh, is it worth it? Did I get what I paid for instead of coming in with curiosity and an open mind? Yeah. Smart. Thank you for sharing that. Pleasure. Should we talk about communicating price changes? Uh, yeah. And then I would, um, yes, briefly, um, unless we stick now with the topic of the workshops, because um, then oh, how do you work with these clients and what is, sure, yeah? Sure thing, sure thing. Uh, I just, you mentioned uh, uh, raising prices yeah, yeah. for the same client. So I'm True. just remembering that, but carry yes. on. Um, then um, Gordon just cut that, um, cut that out. Um, and then after we finish with this part, we can just come back to the, Price changes, um, price changes, communicate. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for sharing this uh, strategy. It's brilliant. And let's take this opportunity to just dig a little bit deeper into your facilitation work on pricing. Yeah. So what... What's the biggest challenge for you in these 90 minutes taster workshops? Mm. Uh, so I think uh, the biggest challenge in workshops in general, actually, and it's related to, to what we were discussing earlier, is um, like hybrid teams. Mm. we're finding at the moment uh, so a lot of our clients are fully remote we are fully remote by design um but sometimes we unexpectedly have it where part of the team are in a room together and then they've got other stakeholders who are joining remotely mm -hmm. um and so it's just been it, like it can be a bit of a challenge to keep everyone focused in that meeting room sat together to sort of stop the the side conversations happening in the room and to just make sure that it is still one conversation in uh in the uh we use miro boards um and in that like online zoom or team session um, I find the breaks are often the most dangerous bit because they'll go and further the conversation next to the coffee machine mm -hmm. and no one else is privy to that. Um, so that's been quite interesting. Obviously, we design the exercises to ensure that they're as kind of uh, inclusive and uh, um, as possible, but still just you know, it's those little side comments in a room and with some clients we have actually encouraged them to just scrap the meeting rooms and even if they are in the office they join separately anyway yeah yeah I can totally relate to that and I haven't I haven't thought of the coffee machine trap yes they will of course continue the conversation um and I think it's it's good to be aware of that because then you can design that in yes so once you know that this will happen and you cannot avoid it, then, okay, after the coffee break, why don't you share with us what came up <laughs> yes. in your conversation? Yeah. Just treat yeah. the coffee break as a breakout group. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what makes a workshop fail for you? Mm. I think if we have missing voices in, in, in the conversation, so uh, pricing sits so centrally to product, marketing, positioning, branding, strategy. And actually, if we have 
uh, one of those um, topics underrepresented, then it can cause real problems later. Um, so in, ensuring we've got the right voices in the room is, is really important. Um, I think this, the second thing that can lead workshops to fail, which doesn't happen too often, but if the culture of an organization is still really hierarchical, um, then it can be a challenge, um, no matter how well exercises are designed to level that playing field and um, really make sure everybody is truly comfortable to have a voice and, and inputs equally. Mm. Um, Interesting. So this brings me to decision making. Mm -hmm. So especially in in very hierarchical organizations, there at least it's clear who who is taking the final decision. And I think for pricing, it's something there must be a decision at some point, and it must be transparent who's taking this decision. And I realized that often um, groups confuse a facilitated process with a democratic or process or something where the group decides at the end. Yeah. What is your experience? Is it um, to get all the voices in to have all the perspectives or is it something that everyone has to agree upon and what are the pros and cons? No, so definitely the former. So to surface all of those key considerations and vantage points from across the organization, but then we always do need that final decision maker. Um, and so we're, we're very clear. Uh, well, we ask the team to decide that up front. Uh, and so that's clear to everybody. And there will be, we defer to them where there are folks in the road uh, or key decision points as we go where we need to start sort of locking things down or ruling out different scenarios um so yeah I, I think that and I mean some uh we could have decision makers for smaller components that might differ but ultimately there's that overarching decision mm. maker and who needs to be in the room for optimal to have the sounding board of pricing <laughs> yeah so for, for pricing decisions it's typically uh, uh those that lead marketing strategy product um uh often the founder or ceo is present because it's such a sort of central meaty strategic topic and also um those that can be the best kind of customer champions and can really kn know their clients or customers the most mm. and how are you and i wonder whether this is a topic in your in your process to deal with money mindset so because there's so much, we talked about that earlier, there's so much stories attached to pricing and everyone has their pricing story. I remember when I was a kid, my mom told me that ladies don't talk about money. And then I be, decided to become an entrepreneur, right? Whoops. Yeah. This was kind of an issue for the first few years. Um, how do you address that? Is that something that you have to make explicit? Or that you even have maybe an activity around, or is it? Yeah. So I, I think I think that's really common that we're just uh, uncomfortable talking about price. So many people in your position, business owners, independent freelancers, suddenly find themselves sort of caught in the headlights when it, they're asked the question. So, what do you charge? Um, and I think that pricing conversation instills fear into some of the most accomplished <laughs> uh, individuals. And, and I, I think that's totally normal. Um, so I, my advice there, particularly for kind of facilitators, coaches, freelancers, is just, you know, it's coming. 
right? Mm. <laughs> so expect that uh, that your your prospective client is going to ask about price. So you know it's coming. So let's get prepared for it. Um, I think uh, practice, 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 practice the words coming out of your mouth. Mm right so practice in the mirror practice while walking the dog just get comfortable with how you say your price um and how you frame it so think have that checklist in your head about um you know the value you're bringing to this what you, they're going to get out of it uh and why they should go with you um but then fo- quickly followed by here, here is the price but then also pause right so I think there's this uh tendency to just fill the space and that's where some may start throwing in discounts or kind of over committing on something else but just give give your the other person or the other people a chance to digest what you're saying and to react mm. um, and it's one of those moments where I think you should fake it until you make it until it does feel super confident so no matter how you feel inside you need to ooze that confidence my price is x big smile right you are fully because if you're not confident in it they're not going to be confident in it yeah Uh, How, how may they yeah yeah exactly but i think also if you don't feel prepared so sometimes early sales conversations can move quicker than you expect Mm -hmm. so perhaps normally price comes up second or third time you talk to them whereas bam someone asks you up front but you haven't learned enough about them or about what they want to do yet don't feel pressured to share a price right you don't even have to share like a ballpark if you're not ready to just like let me ask you some more questions and I'll come back to you by the end of the day. Like no problem and lift that pressure off you in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And I, um, I just realized that, yeah, the difference between pricing as a freelancer or an owner founder and pricing in a corporate is something totally different because we are less attached to it, obviously. So, so then I assume that if you're having these workshops with corporates or scale-ups, startups, then their money mindset is less relevant because it's not, the price doesn't say anything. They don't have to pay it and it's not their product at the end. Exactly. But they are not the product. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Our willingness to pay is much higher when someone else's purse is involved. Um, (laughs) And I think, I think this is something that we often as freelancers or um, solopreneurs that we often forget when we work with corporates that the person we're negotiating with it's not their money no No. and the frame of reference is so very different yeah um I remember so I uh, spent 10 years with eBay um Mm -hmm. actually that's where I initially got the bug for pricing as such an amazing like lever um, but but prior to my sort of time in pricing, I was an analyst. And so uh, we would only focus. So it was a $26 billion European business at the time. And just the, the decisions that we were looking to inform. So we wouldn't do anything that didn't kind of move the needle by less than a million dollars. And so at the time, I used to think that's so cool. I don't get out of bed for anything less than a million dollars. But just then in the in the moment when you're looked at to make these kind of decisions, you've got to decouple yourself from the scale of these numbers, right? Because mm. it was very, very different to my personal reference points for uh, for financial numbers. So, yeah, just remember that. Mm. And fascinating with ebay um what have you learned from your time at ebay about pricing Mm. um so i was uh, responsible for setting the fees for selling on the ebay platforms around europe 
Uh, and so it was, I learned what an incredibly powerful and immediate lever it could be. Um, but I also opened my eyes to the psychology of pricing. So the role it plays in decision making uh, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of how to nudge a customer's behaviors using how you price and what you incentivize. Um, then, of course, on the uh, uh, kind of the customer side of eBay, it's just with their auctions versus fixed price. It's just such a fascinating uh, pricing case study in itself for how um, how items are priced. And uh, we saw, for example, um, just the endorphins that come from winning an auction mm. people often get carried away with that and if you had the, exactly the same product listed as both an auction and fixed price so you could buy it straight away at a fixed price often the auction the final auction prices would be higher than the fixed prices just because people got so into it and um yeah really, Which really is fascinating it is so interesting when we think of economic theory that with increasing transparency about prices, it will all balance yeah. out to, to a standard price. Exactly. And yeah, and fascinating with the fees. I think uh, fees as such a, have such a psychological component. Thank you so much. No worries. Is there? Yes, we we had parked one one topic, which is the communication of price changes. Oh yes, yes, great. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, audience. <laughs> But if someone was waiting for the answer. Yes, um, because I deviated and then jumped on the on the train of talking about the workshops. Um, so what is if we're changing our prices because we think that we um, and there are two ways. So we talked and that's where we parked the question. We talked about overcharging and undercharging. Yes. So I think changing the prices and this would be my assumption when we undercharged, it's quite easy. We can say, okay, the market has changed. I'm more busy now or because of high demand, we're increasing the prices. Yes. And don't be apologetic about it. Mm. I see a lot of apologetic pricing or over-rationalizing uh, or long explanations for uh, all the reasons that sit behind that, um, uh, which, which just don't matter to the customer. So yeah. be clear, like uh, uh, clear and uh, um, addressable, but don't be apologetic. Yes, good one. And what are we doing? What can we do if we realize, oh my goodness, we're overpriced. We have to get this price down without losing face. Yeah, so I think uh, firstly, don't worry, just chalk it up as experimenting. Um, I think if you if you have overpriced, you've therefore learned that by losing a sale, right? So if you're able to uh, get the opportunity to, to just talk to that decision maker for five, ten minutes, just get, hey, like, could you just give me a bit of understanding and what was behind your decision to, well, firstly, did you go with someone else? Did you do nothing? Like, what was the role of price in mm. your decision? Because often you might, the, the easiest things to do when you lose a sale is to go, oh, well, it's because it's too expensive, particularly if you've kind of been really stressed about how to price it. But actually it might be something completely different It might be, well, actually, this company could do it at, I don't know, quicker, or uh, we've worked with these guys before, so procurement would be faster, or any other reason. So if you're able to just sense check, like, what actually happened, and 
Um, if it was about price, then you need to understand that too. So what, you know, uh, if, if they confirm it was because you were too expensive, like what was there? Uh, why did they perceive that price to be too high? Um, mm. You know, how did they evaluate that price? How were they planning to evaluate like the return on that investment? So use it as an opportunity to ask all of those mum test questions that are going to help you next time. Because only then will you know, well, did I overprice by 5% or 50%? Mm. Um, but yeah. don't, don't, don't kick yourself. It's all a learning journey. Or, yeah. Or did I just address the wrong client? Because yeah. maybe the overpricing was, yeah, it was just the wrong, the wrong persona that I tried to sell to. Exactly that. Mm. Okay, so first doing the homework before reducing the price and communicating the reduction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Good conversation. Thank you. But is there anything that you wished uh, to share but we didn't touch upon? I may think of many things after the call finishes Miriam but at this point no um but just I I guess overarching message is don't be afraid of pricing it can be a really uh transformational tool in your business and use it uh use it to your own benefit and uh yeah start start experimenting and start learning Mm, yeah thank you what i'm taking away from this conversation is the playfulness around pl pricing yeah. the the many components and the research behind and why it does make sense to have a persona um, and to do all these empathy mappings exactly yeah um, exactly. that we know from the other side we are facilitating all of that exactly but then to eat our own medicine and to enjoy the process exactly um, that apply what you know yeah or seek help from um, an expert so we'll put your contacts in the show notes amazing great wonderful thank nice. you Jen. it's the end of my podcast <laughs>